Welcome to the Mass Historia Podcast. Prepare for your weekly comedic education from our hosts. Tim, medieval enthusiast and engineering student. This is like <laughs> the best thing ever. Dr. Tom, doctor of nuclear engineering. I fear, I fear what comes next. <laughs> and Udo. Everything that we know will do, that's just, that's nonsense and be garbage. Sit back, relax, and open your mind. It's time to get learned. This is a content warning. This is an educational show, and we are covering historic events, stories, and mythology. If you have a problem with things that happened in history and dislike talking about violence, nudity, and other not very PC topics, you should get gone. This isn't the show for you. Yes. Welcome, everybody, to Mass Historia. I am your host, Udo. And as always, we have the rest of our posse, Dr. Tom and Mr. Tim. What's up? Are you boys ready to ride? You have no idea. <laughs> Only if you promise to keep being a cowboy. Oh, uh, there's going to be so much cowboy this episode. <laughs> I don't know why, Dr. Tom, but I want you to own a cowboy hat. Do you do you have one? No, but I have a lasso. I'm going to get you a cowboy hat. You ju- okay. I just I just feel like Dr. Tom needs to own a cowboy hat. I Should I go why. grab my lasso as well? The first thing I think of when I think of a doctor is a cowboy. I'm a doctor <laughs> wrangling, thank you. Yeah, he wrangles down them atoms. <laughs> you gotta chase my, down them gamma my subatomic lasso right <laughs> i'm gonna go grab my lasso now a- and mr tim tonight you will be playing the part of the horse um okay <laughs> i do have some experience playing horses in the past oh wait no i'm sorry i was playing a horse's ass in the past oh excellent well you're about half ready for the, yeah. the point of the horse so he's got a uh he's got a lasso and i mean our audio listeners will definitely appreciate that lesson. <laughs> yeah, you our audio it. listeners will definitely love Shut the up, fact you that you have a lasso. But no, Let me get I, in character. I'm super glad you have a lasso, though. That actually <laughs> makes me pretty happy. <laughs> so I gotta Play stop. My lovely wife. I gotta stop you for just a second. Okay. Why do you have a lasso? Uh, ask my wife. Hmm. <laughs> oh, it's one was- of those things. <laughs> All right. Was this? <laughs> Okay, I don't know. He's over there being innocent. Like, (laughs) well, no. Okay, I'm not gonna get into on the recording, but I have my own bat. I have my own box of filth. Thank you. Right. And I am not ashamed about it. The lasso came straight out of it. Uh, All right. Yeah. How much top of the box do you two know about the Texas Rangers? A little (laughs) bit, not much. My wife is very offended. We got dirty with the lasso. It's because she rode horses as a kid. She's a real cowgirl. <laughs> I just got the dirtiest. Look. I got hit. I got hit for that. <laughs> Worth it. Uh, I didn't even have to do anything to get him hit this time. Right? Yep. He did it himself. <laughs> I deserved it. <laughs> All right. So for tonight's story, we're going to travel to the early 1810s. This is just to begin with. Which was a very hostile political climate all around the world at the time. Napoleon was busy invading France's neighbors in efforts to build the French Empire. And he caused a chain of global-scaled conflicts known as the Napoleonic Wars. Mm -hmm. France's Napoleonic Empire saw its rise and fall through the events such as Napoleon's attempts to conquer Russia, the War of 1812, and the Battle of Waterloo, where that's where Napoleon was ultimately defeated. Mm -hmm. Imperialism began to encroach towards African and Asian territories through trade, and the U.S. saw mass-scaled migration that headed westward towards the American frontier. Most of this was through the Oregon Trail. Right. (laughs) And this is where our story really begins. 1817, in a little place called Little Cedar Lick in Wilson County, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. 
That was the actual name of the of the the area, Little Cedar Lick. Little Cedar I was, Lick. I was yep. trying to think of a a joke based off of Little Caesar Suck or well, Caesar, yeah. something like that, and it just <laughs> nothing of it came together. So, right. <laughs> A first-generation American Scots-Irish descendant and his wife Elizabeth, Harmon A. Haynes, settled in Little Cedar Lick after a long life of war and service right alongside his indirect-ish cousin, which, and by that I mean his father's mother's husband's sister's husband. What? What? That's the, that's the that's the that's the relation. So the are they in a relation. I mean, it's it, it it mattered back then when everybody was a bit more tribal. <laughs> Fathers, and- mothers, husbands, sisters, cousin. Yes. Uh. So grandmother's husband, your grandfather. So so there's what? there's there's divorces, deaths, and remarriages in there. Oh, those. Slats. That's yeah. cheating. <laughs> anyway. Oh, scandalous. This this relation was none other than future president Andrew Jackson. So this guy, Harmon A. Hayes, served alongside his indirectish cousin, Andrew Jackson, in the War of 1812. So, semi-famous father, a mother that was a born essentially into American royalty, mm-hmm. just out of a war and a world in the middle of expansion, those were the ingredients that usually creates a new human of legendary proportions. And John Coffey Hayes was not one to disappoint. Yes. That's not how I was made. (laughs) Oh, shut up. Wait, wait, legendary. Legendary was the word I used there. Yeah. Not sedentary. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) Oh, fuck you. (laughs) Don't leave yourself open. I left myself leave that open window. for not for bald faced lies. <laughs> you did leave that window hanging right right open. So John lived a relatively peaceful life in early nineteenth century Tennessee. As a peaceful as an early American life could be, due to the fact that it was a land of terrible violence and, you know, medical yeah. medical problems that just killed you. You know, ha- only having a <laughs> only having a one in five chance of dying in an amputation instead of a one in two is is great progress, right? Right. Y- you know it, brother. <laughs> so all of that changed when he turned <laughs> fifteen. For his birthday, he received forced independence. Oh, his mother and father both passed away of yellow fever. John. JPJ! <laughs> Why you do this? They Why'd they ju- piss off JPJ? You know, it's it's just very possible. <laughs> Who knows? Well, JPJ was dead by that point. So <laughs> his specter lived on. <laughs> right. So leaving young John and his six siblings orphans, though luckily they had some mm-hmm. family in Mississippi, and his younger siblings were sent mm-hmm. to finish growing up with them. Um, John, on the other hand, decided that 15 was old enough. Oh, my goodness. I'm an adult. Yep. He decided to go out and get a job as what they call a land surveyor. Mm, Okay. The following information is verified by the Handbook of Texas, a comprehensive encyclopedia of Texas geography, history, and historical persons published Mm. by the Texas State Historical Association. Cool. Land surveying doesn't sound all that bad. When Back you see then, it, though. Right. When you see it nowadays, it's orange vests and hard hats standing on the side of the road measuring who knows what for who knows what reason with, yeah. a, with a state salary and medical benefits, right? Yeah. Early, early land surveying was actually pretty good. Right. In 1832, this was not the case. Yeah, I feel like you get shot if you said a tree belonged to the wrong person. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or to the right person, depending on who's well, mad about it. In, in in terms of surveying, way back when, like one of the reason why like the East Coast has some really weird looking streets right. is oh. the grid system had not been invented yet. the The way you determined yeah. your property was that rock, and then northeastish to that tree, and then southwestish to that tree, and and, yeah, and right. that creek. 
when I when I was over in Ireland traveling the old roads that they still have there because they they didn't like dig up the roads and put new ones in they just still have the same cobblestone ones and just travel cars over them now right it's just confusing over there trying to figure out how to get anywhere uh one of the things that we covered earlier uh when we went through ben franklin pennsylvania was one of the yeah. first people to implement a grid-based system for their city and it in- increase their capabilities of their city to respond to incidences and organize things yeah. massively. Like, at, yeah. at some point, take a look at the map of Boston mm-hmm. and then the no. map of L.A. and compare just how the streets look. Right. Yeah. Right. L.A. is still a nightmare hellhole, but it'd be a lot worse. But it's a grid. Yeah. Right. At least. Right. Whereas, like, I'm I'm looking at the Boston map right now, not a single rectangle. LA's right? problem is one. that LA's problem is that there's too damn many people. The East Coast problem is both there's too damn many people, and also the cities are laid out atrociously. Right. Yeah. So early land surveyors were basically trailblazer style explorers. Mm. With the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, the size of the United States was doubled. Very little of this enormous expanse had actually even been explored, let alone surveyed. In Mm. fact, at the time of the transaction, they didn't actually know how much land the U.S. had just purchased. Oh, my God. (laughs) They they didn't find that out for another, like, eight decades or something like that. (laughs) It was 842,000 square miles or something like that that they picked up. Mm-hmm. In the Louisiana Purchase? Jesus, yeah. So, the survey was first ordered by President James Monroe and began shortly after the War of 1812. This timing was due in part to the federal government's desire to pay war veterans in land. War veterans were given land grants, which then entitled them to certain amounts of land, depending on their status. But before they could claim a parcel of land, it had to be surveyed. Oh, uh, right. yeah. They right. know yeah. what they were giving you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Meanwhile, the average man, settlers, were just chomping at the bit to head west. Yeah. yeah. So it became super critical to survey the land as quickly as possible so that it could either be deeded to veterans or sold to settlers and land speculators. Your average surveyor would head into the wilderness with a rifle, a couple of books, and balls of steel <laughs> in order to live off of the land and record information like when, what kind of... balls tr- to put in your gun, yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is a clean This is a clean PG podcast. Right. <laughs> so, it is? <laughs> uh, well, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. So the these surveyors would record things like what kind of trees could be found, what... Yeah. Uh, animals were in the area, what kind of hostile tribes you might encounter Mm -hmm. in the area. And young Jack Hayes, as he would become to known, eventually traveled uncharted lands and fought off wild animal attacks, hostile native tribes, and starvation itself. The other surveyors that worked with him at times described him as a quiet, well-spoken, skinny fellow and they all agreed that he really shined in situations when violence was called for Mm. when according to the those accounts he was basically a completely different person when his life was on the line when Uh. his weapon came out of its holster they would use the word monster to describe him jesus huh this reputation was all before he turned 20. This was until 1836. A few years back, while Hayes was living in the in the wildlife as a surveyor, mm-hmm. there were things afoot in the U.S. region known as Texas. This was not actually U.S. at the time. Right. This, still this Mexico. Was, yeah. There was this little thing called the Texas Revolution. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. U.S. colonists put up an armed resistance against the centralist government of Mexico. 
While the uprising was a part of a larger one that included other provinces opposed to the regime of President Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, Mm -hmm. the Mexican government believed that the United States had instigated the Texas insurrection with the goal of eventually annexing Texas. Mm. This is honestly that tracks. Yeah, this is very possible. <laughs> I mean, yeah. this is very, very possible. Of, yeah. of I don't why know enough to say started. they definitely did or anything, but it tracks. Yeah, no right. one has ever accused our founding fathers of not being land grabbers. The Mexican Congress passed the Tornell Decree, which declared that any foreigners caught fighting against Mexican troops would be deemed as pirates and dealt with as such. Being citizens of no nation, presently at war in the Republic, and fighting under no recognized flag. Because these these Texan Texan rebels were not U.S. soldiers, right? Right. Oh, well, then. So the Texas Revolution deserves to be covered in much more detail than I plan to give it here today. And in the future, we might do so. Yeah. The- the key point that we need to take from this is that over 400 prisoners of war from the Texan Army of the Republic of Texas were killed by the Mexican army in the town of Goldhead. Not to mention 100 Texans fighting off two attacks from over 1,500 Mexican soldiers until being overwhelmed in the third attack in a little place called the Alamo. Yeah. Yep. Needless to say, there was action in Texas. And that sounded good to Jack Hayes. That monster. Right? At the age of 19, he joined the Army of the Republic of Texas. But he didn't last very long in the Army. Hmm. He was dismissed only because his commanding officers wanted to draft him into something brand new. Hmm. Ah. His brief stint in the Army led him to be chosen to join a brand new group. This group charged with maintaining law and order for the new republic was called the Texas Rangers. Wow, wow, wow. This is, uh, th- you know, this is the time where, I mean, like, I, I I might insert a, like a bling sound from like a, like some, uh, like some spurs or. Yeah. You know, like- <laughs> yeah, it was just like, give me some jangling spurs up in here. Exactly. You like them spurs that jingle, jangle, jingle? Correct. And go right merrily (laughs) along, of course. So with the Rangers, Hayes continued his career as a land surveyor. This is something that he would never give up. He was an explorer surveyor for the remainder of his life. That's cool. In the New Texas Republic, there were a whole bunch of plots of lands that had been purchased or awarded for service, and land surveyors were in high demand. But, as we know, it was dangerous work. Because a whole lot of this land was under the control of the Comanche. Mm -hmm. Mm. And in his capacity as a surveyor, Hayes was in dozens of deadly fights with the Comanches and other southwestern tribes. At that time, Hayes even joined up with a group of of natives to fight off Comanche patrols and Mexican army patrols. Mm. That group that he served with taught him all sorts of information about Native American methods of warfare, and he used that information to protect surveying parties from hostile Native attacks, completely transforming the way that the surveyors in Texas worked. His work as a surveyor and this intelligence gathering soon enough got him promoted to captain of the Rangers. In his new role, he quickly got to work. He took the rough and tumble Rangers and formed them into a paramilitary powerhouse. The Rangers had 40 horsemen under their command. Mm-hmm. And they only had the small charge of single-handedly protecting hundreds of miles of Wild West Texas from threats such as Comanche raiding parties, Mexican army patrols, murderous bandits gangs, cattle rustlers, devious horse thieves, and any other gun-toting marauder that came looking for trouble. Uh-huh. Just a little Easy. job. 
Just yeah. fine. Okay. <laughs> easy, I have a horse. easy, easy. We'll we'll travel. So Captain Hayes had to get this troop up to speed. He began uh, the get well, it, get it up right. to speed to get across all them miles. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you're playing the horse. <laughs> Damn! Damn! I say nay, sir. Right? (laughs) No. Well played. (laughs) So, he began (sighs) the long tradition of Texas Rangers using the newest and most improved technology to outpace anything they faced on the Texas frontier. Among the first things he did was he upgraded the standard firearm of the Ranger... Things like the Edwin Wesson single-shot rifles and other smaller single-shot pistols. And he replaced them with the brand new, untested, highly controversial Colt Revolvers. Uh Ooh. This change turned out to be so successful that Captain Samuel Walker of the Texas Rangers would later place an order for a thousand of them. When they only even had a hundred rangers at the time. <laughs> Damn. So he pulled this 40 man team from a hand picked crew of the toughest riders and gunmen that Texas could muster. Most were Texans, but he also had plenty of Apache, Comanche, Mexican, and Tejano rangers that rode alongside of his crew. Hmm. He also opened shit up. And record, recruited civilians when he could. Huh. Yeah, Specifically if, looking for people who wanted vengeance. Yeah. Mo- right? Motivation is real key. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He trained everybody, got them all up to speed, shot them how, or taught them how to shoot and ride. <laughs> shot them all. Right. And also, this is something that, I, this, this is one of those things that, this is something that I learned that I was like, holy shit. The the early Colt revolvers, mm-hmm. the cylinder was not attached to the gun. Yeah, no, the cylinder came came out completely. So you oh. would, you could reload your five shot revolver just by dropping the cylinder and putting another one in. Why yeah. did they change that? I don't know. I'm curious because like swappable swappable clips seems like a maybe it was kind of unreliable. It it but... was unreliable. It jammed much more frequently. Than, okay. than current revolvers, and eventually the need for the fast reload by changing cylinders was replaced mm-hmm. by the speed loader. That's fair. So they, they, they worked on their horse riding and target shooting, and that also worked as entertainment for the townsfolk. So at the beginning, the rangers, even before they started getting into fights, were starting to become famous in Texas because they were entertaining. Right. Mm, yeah. Before long... Everybody in the Rough Riding Rangers was absolutely hardcore. Right. <laughs> These guys were 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 drilled harder than really any military in the time because the military usually just did, you know, basic tactics and basic training. Here's your gun. Here's how yep. you shoot it. Start marching. These guys had to do competitions for the entertainment of of civilians in order to learn to be badass. And that's yeah. that's one of the big reasons why sports have a lot of competition involved in them. Not only because people like watching it, but because it makes you better at the sport. Right. Yeah. Right. And each of these men were also known to carry very big knives. Like the Bowie knife? Yes, exactly. Things like that. Uh, they definitely, because they were, they were learning hand-to-hand fighting techniques from the tribe members that were serving alongside of them. They were taking the expertise of everybody in the Rangers and sharing them amongst the rest of the Rangers. Yeah. And when we get back, we're going to get into these Rangers antics because (laughs) shit is just getting started. Hey, everybody, this is Zudo. I'd like to take a second to thank you for listening to us. And if you've got any topics you'd like us to discuss, please hit us up on Twitter. We would love to hear it. Our Twitter handle is MassHistoriaPod, M-A-S-S-H-I-S-T-O-R-I-A-P-O-D. You can find us on Twitter. We are also available on Twitch, YouTube, many other different places. We'd love to hear your feedback, so just hit us up. So in 1840, 
the Congress of the Republic of Texas appointed John Coffee Hayes to lead the company of Texas Rangers in its conflict against the Comanche. This conflict was both brutal and stupid on on all sides, <laughs> though <laughs> mostly on the white settlers, as was <laughs> tradition of colonialism. I was yeah. gonna say, and it always right Ain't broke. Don't fix it. Texans and Mexicans were moving through the region, building towns, gathering resources, like some sort of Wild West version of Warcraft, which is totally a game I would play. (laughs) (laughs) No, 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 no. That's a game you would write. Right. That's very true. (laughs) The Comanche people were very much on edge due to a recent happening that that was referred to as the Council House Massacre. Hmm. Whenever an an occurrence is referred to as the something something massacre, it's never a good thing. That's not necessarily true. There mm. was, I mean, it was still bad, but it was not nearly massacre bad. I can't remember what the name of it was, but there was a something something massacre that was like two people. <laughs> so you're just, and you're they just, kind of deserved it. The socks and sandals massacre, <laughs> right? It was still bad, but it was not <laughs> massacre level. So Tim, are you saying? That you're you're just gonna contradict my point with this is gonna get bad <laughs> with with there was this one time that something happened I can't recall it so you can't refute it <laughs> but it wasn't yeah. all that bad yeah that sounds about right okay there's no way this could end well <laughs> well we'll just accept it and move on yes works every time <laughs> so several Comanche leaders came to San Antonio for a peace council and what what happened was neither a council nor peace (laughs) the event was just a giant series of bad decisions the comanche had dozens of texas and mexican captives throughout their lands and camps and the texans were seeking their release the comanche wanted the republic to recognize the sovereignty of comancheria which is the lands of the Comanche peoples. Hmm. But instead of bringing the captives to the council, and we'll find out why here in a second, they brought one Texas captive, a 16-year-old named Matilda Lockhart, and several Mexican children. They also brought lots and lots of Comanche civilians with them, both women and children. Texas figured that since they didn't bring the captives they would just throw the delegates in jail. Tense negotiations occurred in the jailhouse and ended after the after assuring the Texans that the other captives were not actually under the control of these Comanche tribes' influences and that the other chiefs could be ransomed with. And unfortunately, Chief Magura of the Penteca... Uh, sorry, Chief Magura, the Penteca spokesman, ended his speech with the phrase, how do you like that answer? Now, I don't know what inflection was used on that sentence, but if English isn't your first language, you might say it something like this. How do you like that answer? <laughs> Which changes things drastically. <laughs> Either way, the Texas reply Texas replied to them that they were now captives. <laughs> and that that's how a trade is going oh, to go. Oh boy. The Comanche then fought back, and the rest of the Peace Council turned into a giant firefight where Texas militia and armed San Antonian civilians shot indiscriminately until thirty five Comanches were killed, thirty adult Jesus. males, three women, two children, twenty nine Comanches were taken prisoner. 27 women and two old men, seven Texans, including a judge, a sheriff, and an army lieutenant, and 10 more Texans were wounded, and one departed observer who was described as a renegade Mexican. (laughs) So the Peace Council did not go as planned. Not very peaceful. No, not at all. The Rangers served in a lot of battles against the Comanche, including ones such as Plum Creek, Canyon de Ulgad, and Salado, 
but one of the most famous was the Battle of Walker's Creek, which is also known as the Pintatrail Crossing, the Battle of Astus Creek, or the Battle of Sisters Creek, depending on who you ask. Yeah, it's the one right next to Runner's Creek. Right. <laughs> the Rangers thoroughly scoured the hills as far as the Pernaldez River without discovering any sign of Comanches or any sign of any hostile tribes, and reluctantly decided that they needed to turn back. They followed the Pinta Trail to the ford of the Guadalupe River in the area of present-day Kendall County. They set up a camp near Walker's Creek, and one of the rangers, Noah Cherry, spotted a bee tree. Now, I do not know what a bee tree is. I looked and was unable to figure out what the hell that meant other than a tree with bees in it. <laughs> but the fact that he immediately climbed said tree makes me think that it is not a tree full of bees. What What was his name? <laughs> Noah Cherry. No, but I do know a pair. Goodness. <sighs> When are we kicking him out? Ten demerits. <laughs> <laughs> so Noah went up the tree, and uh, so I think that he may have been actually heading up the tree to get honey from bees. Like, hmm. I, the, the, some of the information that I found said that he went halfway up the tree to get the prize. So I think... He was actually tra the bee tree the prize. might actually have just been a tree full of fucking bees. A, a bee tree <laughs> is a tree in which a colony of honeybees makes its home. Okay, well then, I guess that is that is what it is. So he climbed a tree full of bees, <laughs> and when he was up top, he was sp he spotted something. He then turned toward the rest of the bees? rangers. No, it was not bees. It was command <laughs> command cheese. Oh. He called out to the rest of the rangers, and now this is a quote, and it contains an improper use of a word, but an improper to us nowadays, not improper at the time. Jerusalem, Captain. Yonder comes a thousand Indians. But it was actually just six dozen. <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's like a thousand. No one could right? count back yeah, then. Close enough. Yeah, what are one, two, three, a thousand? So Private Cherry scrambled back down the tree, uh, the, the trunk of the tree, and quickly rejoined the 13 other rangers. They saddled up and mounted. The war party of Comanches numbered between 70 and 80 warriors, though in some more pro-Texas sources that I found, this number goes up to 500. Like That's, that's more seen, than three dozen. Yeah, I've seen, like... Most most of the stuff that I saw was 70 to 80, but then when you start getting into the, this is how bad Texas asses is, you know, type of thing, <laughs> that type of that type of historical source, uh, they, th this fight is between an innumerable amount of, of Native Americans and uh, 14 Rangers. But it was 70 to 80, and they withdrew to the wooded terrain nearby, and mm -hmm. we're hoping to initiate an ambush. Mm, yeah. So so Hayes got his rangers and got within a few hundred yards of those woods so that they could watch. When 20 or so warriors rode out into the clear and began to badger the, the rangers for a fight, <laughs> the rest of the war party stayed in the woods hoping to, to spring this ambush. Hayes had too much experience dealing with Comanche fights to fall into such an obvious trap. So he waited, and patiently, eventually, the entire war party emerged from the woods to form lines for battle. So Hayes took his men to a dry ravine near the Comanche line and rode inside of the ravine in order to get behind the Comanche lines. Mm. Eventually, completely unknown, he gave an advance order for his men. 
They rode into the Comanche's back line, dual revolver, 14 men against 80, and immediately overwhelmed the, the, the Comanche forces. Damn. The Comanche forces were then forced to fall back through the ravine and take cover on a hill. From behind the rocks and trees, the warriors taunted the rangers in Spanish hoping then to lure the, them out into making a frontal assault on the formidable defense position. However, instead of attacking, Hayes used the cover of the dry ravine to move his rangers again around the hill and came up behind the Comanches for a second time. Really? Yes. They fell for the same oh. thing twice? Yep. Have somebody watch the back. <laughs> right? <laughs> he quickly formed his men into a wedge formation and led an attack on the rear of the Comanche line. Ben McCulloch, a veteran ranger and Hayes second-in-command, later wrote that the fight for the top of the hill was a bloody, long, drawn-out, hand-to-hand fight, and the quote that he used was, they took it rough and tumble. (laughs) Fighters, they fought fiercely, even though heavily outnumbered. And the Rangers drove off two separate counterattacks that was on their flanks with the power of their Colt revolvers. Dang. Hayes led the pursuit of the Comanche forces for three miles, making sure that his Rangers kept the warriors under heavy fire with their revolvers. His his quote for, for this attack was, crowd them powder burn them that's how close he wanted them fighting during the 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 running three mile hour-long comanche retreat chief yellow wolf rallied his warriors for three separate counterattacks with the rangers fighting in relays Uh, so they would have one of their groups switch switching the cylinders of their colts while the others would be fighting right so kind of like the old the old English way of fighting, where you have you, your your front line firing and your back line re- re- yeah. reloading, only this is seven times faster, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and you have like rocks died behind because these guys were not standing in the open. <laughs> Eventually, Yellow Wolf fell in the attack, mm. and thoroughly demoralized, Comanches fled the field. In the struggle. The casualties were estimated at 20 to more than 50 Comanches wounded or killed, including Yellow Wolf, and one ranger was killed and four injured. Damn. So 14 to 80, they lost one man. That's incredible. Right? Among the latter, the wounded, was Sam Walker. His body was pierced by the thrust of a Comanche war lance. Although he was not expected to live, he did, and eventually, hey. became, eventually became a national hero during the Mexican-American War and the co-designer, along with Samuel Colt, of the famous Walker Colt re- revolver. Mm. So, the guy that Walker, Texas Ranger, is based off of is a guy who got stabbed under this other Texas Ranger's command. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> So, this is just one example of the Rangers fighting and winning conflicts where they were vastly outnumbered, but not outgunned. Yeah. During, during the period of 1843 to 1846, Hayes commanded various sized Texas Ranger units and participated in dozens of gunfights with Native Americans and Mexicans, personally killing scores of his opponents. His ranger units battled rampaging warrior bands of the Southwest tribes, captured horse thieves, who they then immediately shot or hanged. (laughs) No, there was horse thievery so serious. Yeah. (laughs) This is like our fifth story that has our horse thievery. That man stole my fucking horse. Kill him. If you steal a horse, expect to die. That's yep. just how it works. Well, this this is frontier justice. Right? Yep. He then brought law and justice to a wild and unpredictable frontier. He was an excellent horseman, a deadly marksman, and a brilliant strategist. 
He was also super fortunate to have survived, right? <laughs> <laughs> in his time, in those th- th- those three years serving on the front lines with these with these Texas Rangers, he had hundreds of arrows and hundreds of gunshots directed at him, but somehow was never seriously wounded. <laughs> yep. It just managed to have to, just to work out for him. <laughs> <laughs> the fighting was often super furious, and his units were obviously outnumbered most of the time, being that there are 40 rangers in existence. Right. <laughs> yeah. But but at this point, the, the, the technological advantage is huge for him. Yeah. Yeah, he's a laser gun versus cavemen. Like, yeah. <laughs> Well, he can he can put six rounds downrange in the same time that your opponent can do maybe one. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, the 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 difference between you know clubs and spears versus laser gun is pre- is close to you know black powder versus revolver. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, they they were still black powder revolvers. <laughs> right. Right. But he they, had reloadable. Yeah, Cylinders. yeah, musket or barrel, barrel loaded, barrel loaded muskets against, or even barrel loaded rifles, right? Against a revolver. Well, and still, you couldn't, you could reload and carry around a, a preloaded cylinder, right? right. Instead right, right, right. of yeah. having to load it each time, right? Yeah. And often in these fights, the nearest backup for the Rangers was hundreds of miles away. So they were just out there in the wilderness. Yeah. Win or die. Doing whatever they needed to do. (laughs) And according to John Caperton, one of Hay's most loyal rangers and his best friend, about half the rangers were killed off every year. And in their places, they were uh, supplied with new men. The lives of the rangers who went into service were not considered good for more than a year or two. And Hayes served for quite a long time, way more than two years. Yeah. Yeah. In, in 1845, Texas became a territory of the United States. And on February 19th, 1846, the president of the Republic of the Texas re- declared the Republic is no more. The United States Congress declared Rio Grande as the new southern border of America. The burgeoning Western movement of citizens and immigrants to the newly acquired territory increased dramatically yet again. And when we come back, another war is on the horizon, and Hayes and his rangers still have important parts to play. Hey, it's Udo again. If you'd like to hear some more stuff from us or like to help us out, please check out our Patreon. We've got a Patreon over at patreon.com forward slash m-a-s-s-h-i-s-t-o-r-i-a-p-o-d that's mass historia pod on patreon thanks so in may of 1846 general zachary taylor was in command of the u.s army and was assigned to protect the recently annexed texas territory which we foretold at the beginning of this show. <laughs> yes. Uh, maybe they spurred on a war with Mexico so that they could annex the territory. Who yeah. knows? <laughs> maybe, maybe, quote unquote. So a Mexican army raiding party that was captured and killed by, or that captured and killed a group of American soldiers and hostilities between the two countries really started. Mm-hmm. President James K. Polk sent a message to Congress on May 11th, 1846, stating that Mexico had invaded our territory and shed American blood upon American soil. This was the official beginning of the Mexican-American War. Mm. General Taylor asked Texas Mm. to provide military support for the war, and Governor J.P. Henderson contacted the one man he knew who could do something about it 
Jack Hayes. John Coffee Hayes. Right? <laughs> he's, he's another one of those guys who picks up multiple names. So right. John yeah. Coffee Hayes, Jack Hayes. Uh, there's yeah. another, we're going to get into another one that he gets, which is like the coolest fucking names. Uh, <laughs> I've never understood how John turns into Jack as a nickname. Yeah. I mean, I don't it's get not, it at all. You're not shortening any syllables there. Yeah. Or like, I, I could, like Jonathan and uh, Jonathan to John makes perfect sense. Jonathan into the into Jack. What the fuck are you smoking? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Richard into Dick makes just as much sense. Okay. None at all. Right. Exactly. Don't I was just thinking about. All. Have I ever researched why Richard's a dick? <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, He's so- a real dick. That one. Hayes was then elected to the Colonel of the Militia. Ooh. And though officially named the 1st Regiment Texas Mounted Volunteers, the unit was then known by everybody who mattered as Hayes Texas Rangers. So the Texas Rangers have gotten much big at this point. Because it's, it's yeah. what they are. Right. He led his men yep. on a scouting mission directly into enemy territory and the heart of Mexico. He then actively pursued the Mexican army to the city of Monterey. So this was like this was something that I didn't really know much about with the Mexican American War. Mm-hmm. We straight just counter invaded Mexico. I thought yeah. that that was almost all fought in Texas. I was drastically wrong. Nope. Hmm. That you know you got to learn stuff in order yep. to grow. Yeah, it's truth. <laughs> it's truth. On September twentieth of eighteen forty six. Hayes led his 250 Rangers on a combined assault of Monterey, Mexico. The U.S. Army at the time had a command of 2,000 men that was led by General W.J. Worth. They attacked from the other side of the city as Hayes pulled his signature trick and secretly snuck around the back. Right. <laughs> The haze maneuver. If it ain't broke, right. don't fix it. Right, exactly. No, no, it's Just the coffee maneuver. <laughs> he led his men in a pitched battle when they first attacked the city and then proceeded to fight house to house in the streets and alleys of the city for three days. Eventually, they took the city and there was a surrender of all Mexican forces that was negotiated. Under intense pressure from the American assault, the Mexican troops grudgingly abandoned their well-fortified positions and slowly withdrew towards the center of the city. Eventually, when they were trapped in an area of the central plaza and cathedral, along with the Mm -hmm. civilians who had remained in Monterey before the fighting began, they suffered nearly continual bombardments from the deadly American howitzer guns. General Ampuda soon determined that the only course of action was to negotiate, and surprisingly, General Taylor not only agreed, but also granted them surprisingly liberal terms. In exchange for a two-month armistice, the Mexican army was allowed to surrender Monterey, but they were permitted to withdraw from the city with their arms intact. (laughs) Doesn't make much sense. I'm just imagining people like standing there with axes being like, I'm going to have me a shoulder. Right. <laughs> well, the I'm other way this negotiation my- goes is that you guys surrender, but we take all of your arms off. <laughs> <laughs> Honk. That's another one of those terms of phrase that don't really work. <laughs> all right. So I'm trying to figure out at this point if you guys are actually being serious or not. No, what what I what I'm being, arms I'm means being, guns? I know this right. Okay. I'm being facetious, and I think Doctor Tom was too. Yeah, <laughs> I just had the mental image of like just or like arm like guillotines, but arm sized, right? <laughs> and it just has like a sign that says like you must be this nice to not get your fucking arm chopped off, right? <laughs> so, to the Rangers, this felt like a super hollow victory. Many Mm. of them were people who had joined the army because of situations like the Alamo and were looking for revenge. I mean, if you remember, Hayes recruited men looking for revenge. Right. Yeah. So 
they got to withdraw from the city with all of their supplies and almost none of them were taken capture, the rangers then decided to burn down any <laughs> any surrounding villages that they could find in order to quench their blood th- thirst. What? <laughs> Even though it shoots the majesty of the characters that we're talking about today, I'm not going to leave this part out. Oh, absolutely not. Right. That's the ran- super dickheaded. The Rangers were badasses, but they were also people, too, and capable of great evils. Right. The rest yeah. of the Texan forces in Monterey, on the other hand, would go on to commit a huge series of war crimes and atrocities. <laughs> so God there, was a, damn it. there was a whole bunch of civilians in Monterey left over. Not very many when, and not very many were there when they eventually left. Ugh. Yeah, it was real bad. Yeah, uh, uh, and uh, to mention it in case we have anybody who who you know thinks that I should be uh, there's this is a piece of data that I you know feel I should share. Eventually, the commanding officer of the U.S. forces in Monterey. Uh, fully admitted to all of the atrocities and admitted to the fact that he didn't punish any of his men and he got away with it scot free. So, you know, Hell, pretty, wow. pretty bad stuff. Yeah. So, aside from the bad stuff, because the winners write the history books, tales of the exploits of the heroics of Hayes and the Texas Rangers made headlines all around the country. In yeah, fe- sounds about right. Right? Yeah. <laughs> In February of 1847, Texas Governor Henderson sent Hayes to Washington, D.C. in order to convince James Polk to provide more support in terms of money and troops to protect Texas. Hayes made a huge sensation amongst the Washington elite. He was this larger-than-life brass star hero, right? Mm, Yeah. He was asked by President Polk to escort his wife... At one of the society weddings that they were attending. Oh. Yep. So he got to be, he got to have the president's arf. Ar, eh, pre, he got to have president's the president's arf. Right. I com- combined the, the, the word wife and arm at the same time <laughs> because my brain does not work normally. You should probably stop trying to combine words. Right. Uh, the wharf. He made quite a sensation among Washington's elite when he was asked by President Polk to be Mrs. Polk's escort at a society wedding. He got to have the president's wife on his arm in front of influential people. No doubt thanks to Hayes' lobbying, Polk approved the order to raise the additional troops and provide support to the Texas frontier. (laughs) Wharf. I got Every once in a while, apparently, I start quoting Star Trek. (laughs) <laughs> warp 9 Mr. Warf Commander Warf <laughs> Com- <laughs> Fuck that's right Commander Warf I'm an idiot <laughs> So <sighs> okay. In 1847 He was again called upon to recruit rangers To support the United States In the war as me- the war in Mexico Continued President Polk asked him Specifically To lead the rangers To Veracruz President Polk wrote, I suggest that the mounted regiment from the Texas under the command of Colonel John C. Hayes, who has high character and as an officer, be ordered to proceed without delay to Veracruz. So you're, the president was personally sucking his dick. You know, you're you're like you're pompous, dude. I love your pompous man. voice. <laughs> it's so pompous. He became a commander eventually. I swear to God, he was Commander Wolf or Commander Wolf. He was point. Lieutenant Commander. Ah! <laughs> so we're both wrong and right. Commander uh, is specifically the first mate of a Star Trek ship. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're well, gonna have to cut all that shit. It's fine. I'm I'm debraining it now. Just a second. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So very Vera Cruz was a bloody engagement where American forces Mm. were under constant attack by Mexican guerrilla units. Hayes and his men sailed to Veracruz in October of 1847. But by the time that they had gotten there, Mexico City had already fallen to U.S. armed forces under command of General Winfield Scott. Shortly after arriving in Veracruz, 
Hayes and 12 Rangers on horseback. So, this is, I mean, he's got everything he needs at this point. Yep. They Just were like attacked, JPJ. Right? <laughs> they were attacked <laughs> by 200 Mexican guerrillas. Hayes and his men fought the guerrillas off, killing most of the attackers without a single Ranger loss. By sneaking around back. I mean, it's very possible. It likely happened three to four times, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Hayes was involved in several other fierce gunfights and battles during the march from Veracruz to Mexico City, personally mm-hmm. killing several enemies while leading his rangers in numerous battles. The Mexican army would then come to refer to Hayes and his men as Los Diablos Tejanos, the Texas Devils. Which is a fucking awesome nickname. That is right? super yeah. cool. <laughs> that is the, I would say that is more than super cool. That is rad as hell. Right? <laughs> Hayes and several U.S. Army units then went on a two-week march, covering over 500 miles as they captured several towns and routed tons of Mexican guerrillas. By the end of 1847, I didn't know Mexico managed- had guerrillas. God damn it. <laughs> I have had that joke rattling around in my brain for like a good 10 minutes now. You're just like, don't say it, don't say it, it's Don't awful. say it, don't say it, don't fuck it up, don't fuck everything up. Ultimately, but I'll leave that to Tim. I saw the look on your face and I'm like, nope, it's gotta come out. <laughs> so armistice between the US and Mexico was eventually signed in March of 1848. Jack Hayes then led his rangers out of Mexico City and back to Veracruz and had to fight off skirmishes with renegade guerrilla fighters. That does not mean escaped monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> As the war oh, ended, me. Hayes and his troops made their way again all the way to Veracruz and just outside the city, where he had a chance meeting with General Santa Ana. Mm. The deposed Mexican president. Yeah. Yeah. Santa Ana had been granted permission to flee the country, but had to wait for a transport ship to port. On March 28th, Hayes heard that a grand meal was being planned for Santa Ana at the house of General Jose Duran, to which U.S. Army officers were invited. Hayes was encamped only four miles away, so he decided to attend the dinner and pay his respects. Uh-oh. I feel like pay his respects is a, is a euphemism for murder the fuck out of someone. <laughs> it should be. Shit. Like, I can see uh, this either going very well or very poorly. I, Nothing in between. You right. are far more of an optimist than I. <laughs> so, he showed up at the dinner party and was seen by a ranking U.S. Army commander, Major John Kenley... And though Hayes was not dressed in military garb, Kenley approached Hayes and offered to present him personally to Santa Anna. Hayes was then introduced to Santa Anna, and the general is said to have turned pale and refused to even look at Hayes for the rest of the evening. (laughs) As soon as Hayes politely stepped away... Santa Anna pronounced that the entire event was over. Uh. <laughs> he exited the room and was, and then decided that he was going to be transported immediately to the coast <laughs> to board the ship that was taking him away from Mexico to Venezuela. Wow. <laughs> this is, this is Jesus. Big, big dick energy. So, yeah. 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 It wasn't until May of 1848 that Hayes finally left Mexico to return to Texas. Upon arriving back at his adopted home, he and a small group of rangers traveled throughout the state and were met at receptions and balls in celebration of his exploits. On his first night back in Texas, the ball and reception that were waiting for him and his men, they only had war-torn been in battle uniforms in Mexico to wear. So on a Mm. dare, Hayes wore a purloined dress uniform 
from General Santa Ana <laughs> to the event to the enjoyment of everyone in Texas. Did, what did we just talk about with big dick energy? Right? <laughs> For real. Not only did I shut down your shit just by being there, I stole your general's uniform and wore it to a party. <laughs> I showed up and was nice and scared you shitless. Right? <laughs> so That is Jack some big Hayes. dick oh, mood ahead. energy. One more time. Oh, I said that is some big dick mood energy. Right, exactly. <laughs> Damn. So Jack Hayes retired from military duty and was given the job of head surveyor of the <laughs> roads leading west from San Antonio. One of his men sur- on his surveying crew was former Ranger comrade Major John Caperton, who would mm-hmm. eventually later become Hayes' chief deputy in his sheriff position that we'll soon talk about. Although Hayes' job was to survey, he and his crew just ended up exploring previously unmapped areas, looking for major passages west. The landscape and weather were brutal and exhausting. And after 45 days, the party ran out of rations, so they had to subsist off eating their own pack mules and any wild game that they could find. Hayes finally returned to San Antonio in December of 1848, 106 days later, out of the wilderness, desert, mountains, and treacherous territories found to the north and south of the Rio Grande. So, in early 1849, there was a brief moment where he was drafted to the office of Texas governor, but he declined. He was then appointed by the federal government in Washington to serve as an as the Indian agent under the jurisdiction of the newly created Department of the Interior. <laughs> where I'm sure that's going to go well. Right. Where he nope. earned a salary of $400 per year. During the summer of 1849... He helped lead a large military and civilian party on a trek from San Antonio to El Paso, with the ultimate destination being California. Hmm. The terrain was super difficult, and a portion of the travelers broke away to follow a southern route heading to Mazatlan. I I fucked that one up on purpose for sure, right? (laughs) In order to travel to San Francisco by ship. Hayes and a large contingent of the men who were with him continued on the overland route and eventually beat the people by ship. Pansies. Right? (laughs) Bunch of wimps. Among his group was former ranger John Caperton, who eventually became Mm. another deputy. Yeah. John Nugent, who was a budding journalist and would eventually become the controversial editor of the San Francisco Herald newspaper... And after making their way to Tucson, they stayed for six weeks while the party members recovered from various illnesses. But in December fifteenth or December fifth, in eighteen forty nine, they reached the Colorado River, and after crossing the river, Hayes and the company made it to San Diego, California, arriving at the end of December. Immediately thereafter, they reached San Diego. Wait. Sorry. Immediately thereafter, reaching San Diego, they eventually submitted a lengthy report to the Secretary of the Interior about the viability of the new route that they had discovered and the need for protection from Apaches along the route. Yeah, it's great as long as you're not a pansy. (laughs) (laughs) He also submitted his resignation as an employee of the Department of the Interior (laughs) and began his next adventure. And when we return, ah, oh. his story is still not over. Hey, Udo here again. If you'd like to help us out in a way that isn't going to cost you anything financially, we'd super appreciate it if you'd share this podcast on some sort of social media. Guilt trip your friends into listening to our show. It's a really easy way to help. Thanks a bunch. Back to the show. So... The steamship that he eventually boarded for a for the gold rush in San Francisco was named the Colonel Fremont. 
It passed through a violent four-day storm along the California coast, but after five, 15 days at sea, Hayes then sailed it through the Golden Gate on January 25th, 1850. He and his companions found lodging in the Adelphi House on the north side of Clay Street, above the Montgomery Street in the burgeoning town of San Francisco. Jack Hayes' reputation had beat him to San Francisco. San Francisco's newspaper, the Alta, announced that Hayes was headed for San Fran days before his arrival. And while Hayes' intent may have been to pass through San Francisco to join the gold rush in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas, it was only a matter of days before he was approached by San Francisco civic activist Sam Brennan and others, who then asked him to seek the office of sheriff. Ooh. Yeah, boy, get you some. Right? Hell yeah. California was just about to achieve its statehood. And city and county elections were going to be held throughout the state as an array of newly elected officials prepared to take office for the very first time. He was 33 at this time. San Francisco in April 1st of 1850 was the election day. There was a very brief but lively campaign for sheriff. How has this man done so much with his life by the age of 33? That's terrifying. He got started at 15. Right. That's fair. <laughs> Still. Up oh, parents Still. are dead. Might as well become a, an adventurer. Like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess. This is another one of those characters that this guy is a Dungeons and Dragons character. 100%. Right? 100%. <laughs> I'd also like to point out that there is a large, let's call it a learning gap between those times and now. You didn't have to know nearly as much. Right. Back then. Right. That's fair. Yeah. So, two days later, John Towns, who had already served as appointed sheriff in San Francisco, announced that he would be a candidate for the official state uh, job, right? Yeah. He would be running against a candidate with far more money. That candidate was Colonel J.J. Bryant, owner of several other properties, including Bryant's Exchange Saloon and a boarding house. The Democrats elected Bryant as their ca candidate, and Towns took Hayes to task with paid advertisements for failing to make public exposition of his views. Other notable citizens offered up their names for the office, including businessmen named J.P. Van Ness and the chief of police, Malshi Fallon. Neither of those two candidates made it onto the ballot. Hayes decided to run as an independent, even though he had been selected by the Whig Party to be their candidate. He simply just de declined that endorsement. And so Yo they suck. went on care. to endorse John Towns. While Bryant stepped up expensive newspaper advertisements of his various businesses and pre uh, presented concerts from the balcony of his gambling house, Hayes supporters held rallies in the streets in uh, Portsmouth Square. Hayes was a hero of the Mexican-American War, and many of the local militia leaders were strongly pushing his candidacy. He rode through the town on a black horse on election day and ro rolled into the plaza and captivated the crowd with displays of horsemanship and dancing and rearing the horse and firecrackers and all sorts of amazing <laughs> shit that only... I prefer water crackers. Right. It was like um, the, he, he basically rolled into the middle of San Francisco like Prince Ali in Aladdin. Well, he, he, right? basically, he basically rode in and proclaimed to the city, hey, I'm a cowboy. Right. Big dick yeah. energy flag waving, you know? Yep. It's like, yeah, After big the, dick mood energy. Right. After the votes were counted, Hayes was the clear winner with 3,067 votes to Bryant's 1,131 while Mr. Towns was in a very distant third with 262. Get oh, wrecked. So many. Right? <laughs> Bryant immediately challenged the election, claiming that Hayes was not eligible to be a candidate on the ground that he had not been in the state for six months prior to the election, 
But that challenge went nowhere as no one gave a fuck and Hayes took <laughs> office at San Francisco's first elected sheriff on April 9th of 1850. You you Hell can't yeah. say that the guy hadn't been in this state for longer than six <laughs> months prior to the election when the state hadn't been a state. Right, exactly. <laughs> So, in 1850, his wife Susan arrived in San Francisco. This is something that doesn't get mentioned very much. He got married. Mm. At some point, while fighting Mexicans. Like, <laughs> at one of the points huh. when he got to go back to Texas, he got married, and and then he, then he went back to fighting, and then eventually became a surveyor and ran off into the woods for months at a time, ignoring his wife. Yeah, keeping a sweetheart <laughs> on the DL. Right? <laughs> in 1850, San Francisco County was immense, and it went from Fort Point at the Golden Gate to the Santa Cruz County border. It was not until 1856 that San Mateo County was created, and San Francisco County became the 49 square miles that we know today. Mm. In becoming sheriff... Jack Hayes inherited the, uh, a brig, the okay. Euphemia. This was the county jail. What? Oh. It was a boat. That is freaking cool. They had a ship they bought for $3,500 in October of 1849, and they replaced the old schoolhouse that they were using in Portsmouth Square as the city's jail. <laughs> For a while, jail was just this old rundown schoolhouse, but now it's a fucking boat. <laughs> <laughs> nice. The Euphemia was moored in the Central Wharf, which is currently in the intersection I... of Battery and Sacramento Streets. Since the ship did not have any actual jail cells out on it, they they combated this. By buying 50 balls and chains at a cost of $523.80. Oh, my God. If you were to escape the prison boat, you would not make it to shore. Yeah, good luck swimming with oh, a ball man, and chain yeah. hanging off your ankle. I was, so, I was just thinking trying to like run down the pier or something, but no, nope. you're going you're gonna to drown. No, nope, these guys are just out in the middle of the water, literally able to just see everybody and everything, and if they tried to consider escaping, it's just bloop, straight down to the bottom. <laughs> they just get to meander around on the boat, and I am sure, a hundred percent sure, I have no data on this, but I, I say this with the, like, utmost surety. Someone <laughs> pissed somebody else off, and that guy got his ball thrown over the boat. Right. Oh, hundred like, percent. Yeah. yeah. At some point, that I mean, like, jails are that, never not filled with violence. So, <laughs> that is, this is not even on, in question. Not at all. Right? Did you eat my biscuit? <laughs> <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> right. So, I ate your mama's biscuit. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> Eventually, they would install a cell block on the lower deck of the boat, but not for a while. Mm. So a few months into Hayes' term, the prison ship that he had inherited was deemed inadequate. Eventually, he received criticism from the city council, saying that our attention has been recently called to the condition of the prison discipline in the city, the brig, and the station houses that are literally filled with prisoners, we recently heard that one of our city functionaries expressed the opinion that if any more were incarcerated in these places, that they would rival the famous black hole of Calcutta. Mm. As it is, six or eight men are crowded into a single cell, scarcely large enough for one man's accommodation. It has been recommended that another brig be purchased and to relieve the state of our prisons. So they wanted to get <laughs> another boat. To shove yes. people on. <laughs> He's going to be Commodore Sheriff Coffee. Right. <laughs> Commodore Sheriff Captain Ranger Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently, Hayes saw the limitations that just getting another prison ship would, would cause, and he immediately began works on creating an actual construction of San Francisco's first permanent 
County Jail facility. Is it going to be The Rock? Tell me it's going to be The Rock. Uh, at this time, The Rock exists. The Rock oh, already exists. Yeah. It's a it's, yeah, military Yeah, because it was a military fort at first. Yeah, yeah that's right. At this right. point, the military already exists on Alcatraz. Yeah. Right? For Hayes, the year 1851 was consumed with efforts to raise funds to build the county jail. And he had to deal with the fact that there was something called the historic Citizens Uprising of the Committee of Vigilance in 1851. Right. So the history of the 1851 Committee of Vigilance is a complex and detailed story. There are all sorts of books and articles that talk about all of the situations with this. But the thing that you guys need to know is that this is a committee of businessmen and independent citizens that, due to the fact that all that they had in this hugely growing city was a sheriff and a couple of deputies, they decided to create their own police force, their own court system, and their own executioners. Huh. Oh, wow. Yep. I was going to say, this sounds like the 1800s version version of an HOA, but that's uh, that's even worse. Right? Right? Oh, you put some lawn flamingos out in this place, can you catch a fucking axe to the side of the head? <laughs> 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 the committee boasted a membership of over 700 people. Jeez. Jack Hayes was not Damn. a member of the committee, but... He was one of the rare public officials that had the approval and assistance of the Committee of Vigilance. Huh. Huh. He, he was the first, uh, the, the, the man who first approached Hayes about running for sheriff, Sam Brannan, was the prime organizer of the committee. On June 11th, 1850, the committee caught and hung a horse thief. John Jenkins. Stop in, stealing fucking, horses. It's just fucking it's horse what happens. Thieves. It's the worst thing. <laughs> fucking horse thieves come on the coroner uh inquest resulted in no one being charged with a crime even though 200 different citizens took responsibility in the no- local newspaper for the the execution Whoa. meanwhile progress on completing the new county jail was going so slowly that hayes had to contribute over fifteen hundred dollars of his own money to keep the project going. Wow. $1,500 is a lot of money. Remember, a job for the Department of the Interior paid 400 a year. Right. Yeah. Right? After the lynching that occurred of John Jenkins, yeah. members of the Committee of Vigilance were invited by Hayes and his deputy, John Caperton, to inspect the new jail that they were operating, even though it was still under construction. The visit... Detailed in one Mary Williams definitive book on the 1851 vigilantes, uh, the committee, right? The visitors found seven cells occupied. The largest, 12 by 14 feet, held 14 prisoners. And the others, 6 by 9 feet, held 6 each. Jesus. The keeper's room was also finished, and another tier of cells needed only doors to be habitable although part of the building was without a roof. The committee recommended the raising of funds for the completion of the prison at a general meeting on July the 5th, and it was resolved that each member would secure 10 subscriptions of $3 each. (laughs) The, The need to complete the jail became super urgent on June 22nd of 1851. A huge fire swept through the city... And the police lockup on the ground floor of City Hall was lost in the flames. The prisoners were held at the lockup, at, or sorry, the prisoners that were held at the lockup were transferred to the Broadway jail and immediately overwhelmed the available jail space. The committee then solicited funds from its members to complete the jail construction. Over the next few weeks, the committee operated as a shadow criminal justice agency. They they arrested individuals, held them for interrogation in a makeshift jail that was called Fort Gunnybags, which was located at 243 Sacramento Street. 
And the suspected criminals were occasionally turned over to Sheriff Hayes when the committee felt that the local officials could properly dispose of the case. I just gotta say, I am sad that the visit to the jail didn't turn into a visit right. to the jail. <laughs> Let's right. just free up these cells here. <laughs> just say it. <laughs> right? So... The governor published a proclamation in the local papers that called upon citizens to abide by the law and the Constitution in order to try to combat the Committee of Vigilance, but the committee had other plans. Four days later, on the 24th, Sheriff Hayes was invited by several local businessmen to attend a bullfight south of town. According to committee member George uh, Schneck, the vigilantes then clearly lured Hayes to the bullfight and kept watch over him while he was there. With the sheriff occupied elsewhere, the vigilantes stormed the jail at 2.30 p.m. They then took back two inmates, Whitaker and McKenzie. Whitaker and McKenzie were two notorious criminals who had confessed to many crimes, but no murders. But nevertheless, the committee had announced the two men were to be hanged. California's governor learned of the impending executions and rushed to San Francisco. Arriving around midnight, McDougal, Mayor Charles Brenham, and Sheriff Hayes located a judge who issued a warrant for immediate seizure of the two condemned men, and they were <laughs> held in that in that jail. Committee took them back. Within an hour of removing the men from the jail, the vigilantes had built a scaffold and hung Whitaker and Mackenzie side by side. At the bullfight, Hayes was then alerted to the storming of the jail and immediately rode back into town. By the time he had arrived, both men were cold. And now he's pissed. Right? Yep. So during the... the Don't piss <laughs> off a Texas Ranger! Right, D- exactly. Damn right. Some bad shit is going to happen gonna, to He's going to round up, like, nine people and then <laughs> kill, like, You're, 300 of them by sneaking around back. I was gonna say, yeah, he's going to bring, like, I was going to say, he's going to bring, like, a dozen dudes and kill your entire fucking city. During the first 40 years of California's statehood, so during this time, it fell to the county sheriff to implement the death penalty. Right. The citizens of many counties took the matter into their own hands prior to the first years of statehood, but the court and justice system had been developed. Legal executions became a relatively common occurrence. California yeah. sheriffs executed well over 230 individuals before the responsibility was transferred to the state prison system in 1892. So at this time, executions are John Coffee Hayes's business. Yeah. Sheriff Hayes performed San Francisco's very first legal execution on December 10th of 1852. The city saw four men executed in extrajudicially in 1851 by the Committee of Vigilance, much to the horror of chagrin, or sorry, much to the horror and chagrin of San Francisco's judicial and political leaders. The first man to face a lawful execution was Jose Forner, a 32-year-old native of Spain who was working as a cook in Hotel Nueva Mondo for six months. According to his confession, he stabbed a fellow Hispanic to death who had stabbed him and tried to rob him. In a matter of weeks, he was convicted and sentenced to be hanged. I, does self-defense not play here? No, they were Hispanic. Yeah. Whoa. Right? Fair. I mean, to be I fair. I mean, that's history, yeah. Yeah, it's history. Well... One if you don't, at- if you don't can't handle it, get gone. This ain't the show right. for you. I mean, we're oh, talking, what? We're not okay, I can handle it. Just also right? sucks. Yeah. <laughs> we're not covering up for any atrocities. We're yeah, no, absolutely. I get it. Right. <laughs> just also that sucks a lot of butt. Yeah, right. it, it really does. One month after the Jose Forner execution, Hayes, unable to deal with the pure amount of horseshit from the Committee of Vigilance, 
took a four month leave of absence during his post as sheriff. Oh, in that's 18, not great. Right. In 1853, yeah. he sailed to the East Coast and went to Washington, D.C. He attended the inauguration of President Franklin Pierce and set, it's set to seek appointment as Surveyor General of California. He was successful. Ooh. Four days after his return to San Francisco, he submitted his resignation as sheriff to accept the position as Surveyor General. One of his deputies, Thomas Johnson, was appointed by the Board of Supervisors to complete Hayes' term of office. He was fundamental in the founding of the city of Oakland at this time. Hayes or the deputy? Hayes. Okay. He served as the state's surveyor general until 1856. He continued to buy and sell real estate in a partnership with his lifelong friend, John Caperton. Hey, Hayes, John Caperton's back. Right? <laughs> he and his wife, Susan, had five children. Two of them died at a young age. And they moved into a beautiful tract of land along Temescal Creek in Oakland called Fernwood which is located at the Mountain Boulevard and Thornhill Drive nowadays. Each day, Hayes would ride down to the Oakland waterfront and take the ferry to San Francisco and his office at the surveyor's office. Occasionally, when he missed the ferry, he would throw row himself across the river that day. Or sorry, row, him, row himself across the bay that day. Jack Hayes became a lifelong activist and local statewide Democratic politician. He served as the delegate to the state convention. And it's reported that during the Civil War, both the Union and Confederate leadership asked him to lead a military unit. He declined both, deciding to concentrate on local issues. Oh. There was one last big gunfight in Hayes' life. In 1859... When the Comstock load was discovered near Virginia, Virginia City, local Paiute marauded and robbed local miners and settlers, killing several. Hayes traveled to Nevada, assumed leadership of a force of several hundred volunteers, and dispatched the entire war. Hmm. He brought with him a detachment of artillery and infantry from Fort Alcatraz. Hayes and his volunteers waged a war of running gun battles with the Paiutes for several weeks. There were numerous casualties on both sides, and the attacks on local settlers were eventually stopped. The Paiute War was Hayes' very last fight. He lived another two decades, though, immersed Damn. in Democratic politics in California and managing his vast real estate holdings. He was a member of the UC Board of Regents and the director of the Deaf, Dumb, and Blind Asylum in Berkeley, which is the precursor for the California School for the Deaf and Blind. Huh. He was a major stockholder in the Oakland Gaslight Company and the f founder and director of Oakland's Union National Bank. In his final years, he suffered from painful rheumatism, but... He died at the age of 66 in his home in Oakland. And he's, him and his entire family are buried in Oakland's Mountain View Cemetery at the foot of Piedmont Avenue. This is the least violent, like, death we've ever covered. Right? <laughs> yeah, they always well, die no, in battle. No, like, you were like, and that died in bed. Yeah, you were like, and that was his last fight. And I was like, oh, he got shot and died there. Nope. Oh, man. <laughs> he went on to start a school for the blind. Like, That's super <laughs> rad. He went from violent, like, violent Texas ranger scouring the world of anybody who would stand against Texas to, an, for, to a kind old ex-sheriff starting a school for the blind. Like... <laughs> The John Coffey Hayes School for kids who can't see good and want to learn to do other stuff good, too. And, yeah, specifically, the, it, it was called the yeah. the Deaf, Dumb, and Blind Asylum. But huh. that wasn't as terribly offensive as it is now. Right. Right? Like, <laughs> like my, you know. my legit understanding is that dumb at one point was essentially synonymous with mute. I could totally be yes. wrong. You I'd know, be making is, a butt of myself. correct. Yeah, it was okay, the, yeah. the, the medical 
um, yeah. medical diagnosis of being dumb. The, the, the phrase, what, are you dumb, was in direct response to somebody not talking. Right. Yeah. So... One of the things that uh, to cover here, it seems like I skipped over some resolutions of some stuff. I didn't. The Vigilance Committee took advantage of shit for a long fucking time and eventually were shut down by the fact that there was big government. Right. It's kind of a, kind of a, a cautionary tale that you can't win every battle, and sometimes the best idea is just not to fight it. And let everything else just blow over. <laughs> right? Yeah, and fucking right? quit while you're ahead. <laughs> right? All right, everybody. Join us next time when we cover another interesting topic. Hell I don't yeah. know what it's going to be yet because that's what the life that I live now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do Chernobyl. I want to do Chernobyl so bad. I, you know, I've been thinking about it, but isn't that just coattailing off of the show that's out right now? Uh, okay, I haven't actually seen the show, so but I get you. And I bet that it's going to be super hard to research with all of the like the 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 arguments that are out there right now. That's fair, right? <laughs>